Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast brought to you by Reality Sports Online. I'm your host, Scott Bogman. Follow me on the Twitter at Bogman Sports. And as always, I'm joined by Pat Fitzmorris at Fitz underscore FF on the Twitter machine. Fitzy, what is going on, my friend? Bogs, how you doing, man? Uh, coming off the long holiday weekend, and it seems like, you know, well, we've got this period between the holiday weekends, Memorial Day, Labor Day. That is our runway to the football season, and uh, we are just clearing the terminal and hitting that runway and uh you know it's going to be fun as we build up to taxiing speed this is where like the real preppers prep this is where you start your prep you know if you're like us and you work on it you have to prep way before this you know uh obviously uh, i've been working on the black book a bunch we've been doing this show i've been doing stuff for in this league so we're in the middle of it but this is really when everyone starts to hit that grind uh, there's a lot of drafts that are happening right now, a lot of first-year player drafts, a lot of uh, dynasty startup drafts. So uh, over the next um, you know month here, we are going to take a look at deep dives at uh, certain positions here. And today we're going to do quarterbacks and tight ends. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at everyone that is ranked beyond the top 24. So in your standard 12-man league, that's you know two quarterbacks apiece, two tight ends apiece. When we get into running backs and wide receivers in, in the future, we'll do a little deeper than that, obviously, probably past the first 36, 48, somewhere in that neighborhood. But today we're going to be doing QBs and tight ends and just taking a look at the deep dives, who you want to throw a dart on, who you want to take a flyer on, um, who we would take a, a flyer on or throw a dart on. But before we get into the meat, I got to tell you about some stuff going on here at Fantasy Pros. We have a giveaway for DeAndre Swift autograph jersey. We're doing right now because it is june all you need to do is subscribe to our youtube channel youtube.com slash fantasy pros take a screenshot submit it to fantasy pros.com slash dynasty contest that's fantasy pros.com slash dynasty contest you are entered into win do it as soon as possible because it will end at the end of this month so we're just starting right now but get in as soon as you possibly can our discord is also awesome it's free to enter but premium members uh, and subscribers get a whole bunch of other perks like dozens of extra channels regularly scheduled amas and interactive voice chats with our analysts want to talk fantasy whenever you want or chat with fantasy pros analysts just check out our discord at fantasypros.com slash chat again that's fantasypros.com slash chat i do one every single monday at 8 eastern where we usually talk about dynasty stuff i answer a lot of trade questions uh we're talking about uh, there's a lot of slow drafts going on right now. So I get a lot of who would you pick between X, Y, or Z. Uh, these questions are great. And most of the time, I'm not even really answering a question. I'm answering, I'm really confirming uh, what a lot of people are saying. I'm picking between these three guys. Who would you take? You know, people get real excited when I pick their guy or they say, really? Why would you take this guy over that guy? And then I explain myself. So, you know, uh, those are a lot of fun. And uh, Pat, I know you do them weekly as well. You, you're more of an AMAs. I do the stages. So we're a little different, but uh, you can get your question asked if you join the Discord. It is a lot of fun. So Fitzy, let's dive in here on quarterbacks. And uh, we have a whole list here. So quarterback, I think, is different because, um, you know, with running backs, you're looking for where can you get a job? Where can this guy prove himself? Same thing for wide receivers. They need to get on the field. Quarterbacks, you're throwing darts because there's 32 jobs. We know who has, you know, 28 of these jobs. So there's really only a couple spots where the job is up in the air. Is it going to be this guy? Is it going to be that guy? Pittsburgh is one that comes to mind. If Carolina does scoop up uh, Baker Mayfield or Seattle scoops up Baker Mayfield, that would be interesting. You know, Atlanta, I guess the job could be had. It's most likely going to be Mariota. You know, so there's a couple spots where jobs are open. But um, beyond the top 24, when you're looking in a standard, we're talking one QB league where everyone has two. So you have your starter and a backup. Uh, super flex, it obviously gets deeper. But is there is there something, is there a parameter that you keep in terms of quarterbacks, Pat, that, you know, they have to be under 25, they have to be in a winnable situation, or is it just, I like the weapons or I like the skill set that this player has. And that is why I would take a flyer on them. Yeah. Nothing structural for me, Boggs, just maybe some, maybe it's skills and no role. Maybe it's uh, you know, a foothold in a role and they've shown us a flash of something before, but you know, we're going outside the top 24. So I think we're not aiming too high as far as these quarterbacks go. And 
just to kind of help with the framing of this episode. You know, I think a lot of leagues have done their rookie drafts already. I know personally I am uh, in my last rookie draft right now. Like it's a, a slow draft. So this is maybe the time of year where people have a few months to just sort of tinker around with the roster and, uh, you know, like get under the hood and sort of mess around with things. And <laughs> maybe they're doing that with their, you know, oh, from roster spot number 21 on, you know, they're doing it at the, the bottom third of their roster or so. So um, like with these guys, I mean, we're looking for guys who realistically like they're going to be maybe your your QB three this year or guys who you know might not even be good enough to be QB3 guys who don't have roles right now but could develop into that and maybe develop into like QB2s or or maybe just maybe QB1s down the road. And a lot of those um leagues where you're looking at deep are either super flex, you know, where you're beyond a third quarterback or your rosters are just insanely deep. There there are some leagues where it's just, you know, you have 50, 60 spots on your roster, you have the full 53 and you're not playing with offensive linemen. So you're going to be taking, you know, throwing darts on a lot of these quarterbacks. So uh, let's, I'll, I'll let you go first. Is there someone that stands out that is, uh, and we're doing ECR, not ADP because there's just not enough ADP data really uh, at this point to uh, go off of it. So we're doing ECR expert consensus ranking on fantasy pros. These are guys that are ranked 25 and below is there one that jumps off the page at you that this is the first guy that comes to mind when i think about throwing the dart on a quarterback i don't know if he really falls into that category box but i think this is a guy who a lot of people have sort of left for dead already and i'm not quite ready to take that last shovel full of dirt and uh you know <laughs> throw it into the the hole in the ground it's daniel jones and so i think maybe the the death knell for a lot of people was when the Giants didn't pick up his fifth year option on his rookie contract. So he's going in to 2022 as basically a lame duck. And the Giants, they're kind of in this rebuild. If, if things go poorly for them, very likely they're dipping their toe into the quarterback waters next year. But, um, you know, that said, like Jones has the running dimension we're looking for. Yes. Uh, you know, barring the turf monster jumping up and, and getting him on long <laughs> touchdown runs like this dude's mobile. We like that. And, you know, he's been a turnover machine. That has been yeah. his downfall, like fumbles, interceptions. I mean, he's just given it away way too much. And if he can't shake that, he's done as a starter. You know, he'll right. catch on as a, a backup somewhere, maybe just because that's of the, the reason they didn't pick up that fifth year option is because of those turnovers for sure. Yeah. And he he just hasn't given them enough to make that sort of financial commitment. And I totally understand that. But it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that he's done with him. If, if things are going swimmingly two months into this season, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we saw a, a contract extension, if the you know Giants were a, a surprise five and two to open the season and, and things were going great with Brian Dable and the new offense. And, and Dable is really one of the reasons I'm enthusiastic. Like yes. I, I think it was uh, Jordan Renan, one of the giants beat writers who wrote about how early on, like first few days after Dable's hire, he called Jones and was like, what kind of plays do you like to run? Like go, go back to high school if you want. Well, like, what are your favorite things? Favorite things to do, favorite things for, you know, when you get this play, you're really excited about it. Tell me, he's trying to build around his strengths. And, and this is a guy who had success developing Josh Allen. And look, Daniel Jones is not Josh Allen. He does not have that caliber of an arm. But maybe it's the, the basic uh, Josh Allen starter kit with the mobility. Um, you know, he's not going to be able to thread the needle on 30-yard seam passes like uh alan can but like there's there's mobility there um maybe he can turn this guy into a poor man's josh allen and we kind of like the weapons like they're they're starting to build the offensive line an intriguing group of wideouts i mean if they get reasonable health out of a group that includes kenny galladay um Kadarius Tony, Tony, Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, Wandale Robinson. Robinson. Yep. Yeah. So Saquon can catch passes out Saquon, of the backfield. Yeah. So there are a lot of injury issues here. But if there's good health with this wide receiver core, he does not have a shortage of weapons. 
I'm I'm on the Daniel Jones as a, you know, uh, grab and stash for sure, especially, you know, if you're in a deeper league and you can get him as your QB three. I think he's a fantastic option. Uh, I think that's a great one. And, you know, uh, Mike uh, Katka too, their their offensive coordinator. The last uh, couple years was the uh, quarterbacks coach for the Chiefs. So, you know, um, helping develop a guy like Patrick Mahomes, you know, Patrick Mahomes has just natural crazy ability. We all know that. And it's all, you know, it's all about the products on the field, not what's on the sidelines, but that can also help. And, you know, bringing that mindset of, look, what do you want to run? Not adhere rigidly to my to my structure is something that coaches are doing better now and i think you you get the best out of your players when you ask those questions you know uh, that's something that you know gruden had success but he never did with his quarterbacks it was you will throw the ball the way i want you to throw it you will use this the way i want to do it and you're going to learn and take instruction not i'm going to listen to you i'm the experience you're listening to me so i think this adjustment that some of these uh, newer coaches are making is very, very smart. So um, the next guy that we have highlighted on the list, I know is one of yours as well, but it's Davis Mills for Houston. And for me, uh, Pat, it really seems like they are committed to Davis Mills. I scoffed when they picked Davis Mills. I was like, what are you doing? Taking D Davis Mills didn't have success at Stanford. Now he came in as a, five-star recruit, top quarterback in the country, all that good stuff, you know, uh, big frame, big arm, all of that. Uh, they fell in love with him in the draft process because low heartbeat, you know, a guy that's going to come in and not be nervous. He's not going to flinch at a big situation. And that is exactly what this guy has done at the NFL level since last season. He looked uh, outstanding. He didn't flinch. Um, you know, a lot better than advertised, especially coming out of what he did at Stanford, which just tells me maybe Stanford is down a little bit and didn't really uh, get behind him. New coaching staff in Houston as well. So there will be some changes, but um, he played well enough to make Houston look like they are committed to him. A bad year this year. Sure. He goes away, but there are way worse dart throws on this board. So I'm big in on Davis Mills and I know you are too, right? Yeah, I actually traded for him in a 14 team dynasty league where I needed a what it need, cost what it cost yeah That's what we so it was it was draft considerations mostly okay like I gave up uh you know I gave up some draft capital for him not not a ton you know not like a first round pick or anything but, right uh I think I've slid down in like across the board uh throughout the draft so um like I needed it. I had Tua and I think Drew Locke were my top two quarterbacks yeah, at that point. Okay. So, yeah. you know, I needed a guy and but <laughs> I, like I'm actually I'm interested, as you said, you know, it's it's possible this goes away. The Texans are not going to be good this year and it's possible they wind up, you know, getting Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or uh, Van Dyke from Miami, one of one of the top quarterbacks in this next class. But even if they do do that, it doesn't necessarily spell the end of Mills tenure as a starter. He could land up land somewhere else. Um, you know, maybe he turns up as one of these top level backups, a guy who sort of floats between like a starter you don't really want to commit to or, or a high level backup. But like I'm encouraged by that uh, showing last year and how he did seem to legitimately get better as the season went on. And you know, in 13 games, 16 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, maybe a few more interceptions than you'd like to see, but a 6.8 YPA, like that's passable for a rookie quarterback. And when you factor in the lack of, of talent around him, um, you know, the 66.8 yeah. completion percentage, like the numbers were good and it actually looked pretty good when you, when you saw it on Sundays. So I'm, I'm intrigued. Definitely. I mean, just, there was a lot of Rex attention Burkhead was his number one running back. Yeah, exactly. For a, a big chunk of the you, season. Yeah. You know? That, that sums it up perfectly Bogman. And for a guy, there was just so much attention on the quarterbacks taken in the first round of last year's draft. The mills really slipped under the radar and let's face it. He had like a better rookie year than some of the guys taken in the first round. He really did. He really, really did. So, uh, you know, he is definitely on both of our radars, you know, there's a lot to be said about the rookie class. I mean, you can just take the rookie, this rookie class specifically, because, you know, the only starter that we were getting for sure 
uh, this season is Kenny Pickett. And that, you know, Kenny Pickett isn't for sure either. You know, um, during uh, OTAs, it was said that Trubisky just looked leaps and bounds better than any other quarterback in, you know, on the Steelers roster right now. Trubisky is definitely one of those guys who um, I had been calling out for the last couple seasons of, I just want to see this guy get an, another shot. I want to see him get another shot. I was super happy because not only was he getting another shot, it was with my team, the Steelers. And then the Steelers spent the first round pick on Kenny Pickett, which uh, surprised me, number one. And number two, I want a Malik. So I was a little disappointed that uh, it happened that way. But Trubisky is another guy that you can take a shot at, you know, and that is more about. They never really put Trubisky in position to win, and he won in Chicago. Let's not forget, this dude's record is still over 500 in the NFL, Trubisky. I think 20 and 17 is a starter, so um, much better than expected. And just the the story, it just blows my mind that an NFL head coach, Matt Nagy, would not show up to quarterback meetings with his court. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing if you're not showing up to work with your quarterback? What, what could you? What is more important at that job than making sure that your quarterback is okay? So I'd love to see him. You know, obviously you're sitting behind Josh Allen, you get no chance. But in Pittsburgh, he has a chance to win a job. So I'd like to see him. So he's a nice dart throw. Uh, do you have any love for Trubisky, or are you more on the Pickett side? Pickett makes more sense. I mean, they spent a first round pick on him, so you want that guy to succeed. But any love for Trubisky, or are you just? I saw what I saw and I wasn't impressed. No, I, I agree with your take on the Matt Nagy situation. It just seemed like he was never, and this is, I mean, like the way we discounted Sam Darnold's uh, early struggles because of uh, Gase, Adam Gase. Yeah. So like we were kind of willing to give him a mulligan last year in Carolina, at least I was, and uh, you know, it, it didn't, didn't go didn't well. Work. Didn't yeah. work. So maybe that's what we're looking at here. But I mean, Matt Nagy, at least, I mean, it seemed like Gase was like trying to coach Darnold. For some reason, there was some sort of weird alienation with <laughs> Matt Nagy just not wanting to, um, you know, bring Trubisky into the inner circle. I don't, I don't understand it when that's like, you know, that's your guy. That's the best quarterback on your your roster. So, um, yeah, you got at least feign interest. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to have in your brain. Uh, this is my guy and I'm behind him. You have to say that publicly, but you at least have to show up to do your job you know, yeah. at, at and, the very least. And, uh, you know, Trubisky, to his credit, like being here in Chicago, I've kind of seen how this was handled. Like Trubisky, through the struggles, didn't point fingers at anyone, always we accepted blame. We didn't hear about blame. this story until Matt Nagy got fired. Yeah. So this that was, was my... really classy, I feel like, by, by Trubisky for sure. Yep. Yep, it didn't come out until I think it was my my guy Adam Fishbane at the Athletic and uh, one of the other Bears beat writers reporting on this. But um, so yeah, I, I'm like not totally finished on him, and I do kind of think Trubisky is going to be one of those guys who um bounces around between like maybe stopgap starter and coveted backup. Um, you know, like he was he was Josh Allen's backup last year. They were yeah. confident enough that if things something went wrong and they lost Allen for a few games, Trubisky could come in and give them that, you know, proxy uh, mobile quarterback production, I guess. So yeah, Steelers um, offensive tackles. No quarterback is safe back there, by the way. So yeah. Fox, you know. if you if you had to bet right now, who would you say? What would you uh, handicap it for? Who is quarterbacking the Steelers in week one? I would bet on Pickett because the Steelers spent a first round pick on him. If it's close at all, they're just going to go with the guy that they spent the first round pick on. You know, you want this guy learning on the job. You want him to get experience immediately. So, uh, you know, when the big moments do come up, you can shine in them. So um, I would have I would have Pickett probably 60-40. Uh, over Trubisky. I know Trubisky has the lead right now, but I think as stuff develops, if it gets closer and if it's close at all, if it's Trubisky by a nose, it's Pickett. If it's um, Trubisky by an arm length, it's Pickett. It has to be, Trubisky has to be the no doubt way better. Like Trubisky has to play awesome in the preseason and Pickett has to be bad for Trubisky to get this job. So I'd say well over 50%, probably 75%. Um, now the more I'm talking about it, pick it over Trubisky. So yeah. are, you, are you about the same on that? 
Yeah, if I was, uh, you know, if I was setting odds for one of the books, I'd say maybe minus 120 for Pickett and uh, even money plus 100 for Trubisky. Like the only reason I, I pause on that is that uh, Tomlin does seem like kind of an old, old school guy. But on the other hand, Tomlin is also sort of um, like he's he's a smart dude and he knows like eventually they're going to have to get Pickett in there. I think this year. right like they're they're not going to. I don't think Trubisky is going to hold him off and and make it be a full red shirt season for Pickett. I just don't see that happening. Yeah, if if that does happen, it means Trubisky's playing really well. So I'm all about it. Let's yeah, but uh, it, at yeah, the let, same time, let's box, have it happen. I mean, Tomlin has never finished under 500. Never. Right. In in a that long was with Duck tenure. Hodges and Mason yeah. Rudolph. So I think I, I'm I'm so much happier with the battle between Trubisky and Pickett than I am with the battle between Mason Rudolph and Devlin Hodges. So yes. uh, I'm very, very excited about the potential uh, for this season. Uh, before uh, we uh, talk about a couple more quarterbacks here, I got to tell you about Reality Sports Online. And by now, most of you have probably heard of Reality Sports Online, the powerful fantasy sports platform where owners get to build and manage their fantasy team like an NFL general manager. But the question is, have you tried it? It's time to go see what all the buzz in the dynasty community is about. Free agency, multi-year contracts, a rookie draft, multi-team trades, franchise tags, contract extensions, first-round rookie options, automated contract and salary cap functionality, and much, much more. I think it sounds complicated. It's not. The best thing about Reality Sports Online Fantasy Front Office is that it doesn't take any more time than a standard league. It just requires more strategy. Think you're among the fantasy elite? Well, this is the platform to test your metal. Still not sure? You can test your general manager skills for free, FRWE, in a mock free agency auction. If you like what you see, use a promo code FANTASYPROS to receive a 10% discount on your team or league today. Fantasy just got real at realitysportsonline.com. Uh, a couple more of these rookies. I mean, look, uh, you know, in first year player drafts, obviously the quarterbacks are going to go, but if they're all bunched together, they're all mixed in. Malik Wills isn't a starter. Uh, Matt Corral isn't a starter. Sam Howell's not a starter. So is there anyone in particular out of the other rookies that were high end quarterbacks um, that, you know, none of them landed in a potential starting spot except Kenny Pickett? Who are you uh, wanting to throw a dart on? if uh, all of these uh, rookie QBs are mixed in with the regular bunch in startups. So I'm going to be, uh, I guess I'm going to be true to our deep dive thing. And I'm going to take Willis uh, and Pickett and Corral off the table. Cause I think they're okay. being groomed as eventual starters. And okay. I'm going to zero in on a guy. Uh, I think you just mentioned Sam Howell, um, mm -hmm. who. I mean, he is just being left for dead bogs. I, I picked him up at, I think, 304 in that 14-team rookie draft. So early third, and this is a super flex, and it's a 14-teamer. So that was like the 32nd pick overall. I think dudes like Hassan Haskins were going before him <laughs> in, in you know a super flex where there's such a premium on the quarterback position. And this is a dude who... As I think you know, Bogman, you follow college football as closely as anyone I know. Going into the 2021 season, most early mock drafts had Sam Howell as like a top 10 pick, if not yeah. top five. Like he super. What we read going into the draft, most teams had him as number one on their board. So, yeah. you know, uh, it was surprising not to see him. Yeah, I don't think he had a good off season. Um, you know, but like pretty bulletproof resume his first two years at North Carolina, like precocious production at a young age. Then he loses before his junior year, Javante Williams, Michael Carter, uh, Deami Brown, and Daz Newsom, I think was the other yeah. guy. So pretty much, yeah. yeah, exactly. Pretty <laughs> much all his weapons disappear before his junior year. Still goes out, like doesn't light it up, uh, you know, quite the way you'd hope he would. But there's a viable excuse, like he lost all his weapons. And um, then, you know, I know he didn't have the senior bowl week. Some people were hoping for he didn't have the combine. Some people were hoping for apparently there were rumors that he was maybe, um, you know, not like the the fiery, boisterous leader type uh, like, you know, Mac Jones really impressed people apparently last off season with the way he took charge of of the huddle and things at the senior ball the and, quiet demeanor stuff it was also what we got on herbert which is why a lot of people weren't yeah. in on herbert but i mean obviously the skill was there the guy's got a rocket golden arm so 
uh, you know, and, and wheels and he's much taller. So, but it's the same type of it, that, that, that was the big knock was he wasn't a raw, raw leader type, which at that position you do need. So, yeah. And I, I recently, I think it was on NFL network. I heard Ron Rivera talking about their draft class and they were asking him about the hall pick. He was like, yeah, he was kind of there. So we grabbed it. Like it wasn't an enthusiastic endorsement, but <laughs> Anyway, you've got this guy with a pretty impressive college resume who once had like first round, uh, you know, was in the conversation as a high first round pick. And he goes to the situation where he's playing behind a quarterback who, I don't know, for my money kind of sucks. Like I've, I've sort of seen enough of what I need to know about Carson Wentz to uh, write him off as like a guy who's ever going to hit that live up to the ceiling we saw in maybe his first couple of years of Philly. I just don't think he's that guy anymore. So, um, yeah. yeah, there's a, there's an opening here for how I'm intrigued and considering how dirt cheap he has become. Uh, I'm totally all for taking a shot. Yeah. I, I like this call in, in, um, you know, in the black book, I was writing up the rookies. Uh, I mentioned specifically about how I like Sam Howell over Matt Corral because Matt Corral in his scenario, Matt Corral went two rounds earlier. So look, you know, just, in ranking, you have to have Corral ahead of how I, I understand it. Like you mentioned, probably being groomed as an eventual starter. But the situation in Carolina is so tenuous with Matt Rule. Like he had to fire his whole staff and bring new people in to keep his job. And he did it. But if you're not successful with these guys, then he probably gets fired. Uh, they'll be bringing in a whole new coaching staff. And this coaching staff isn't the coaching staff that brought in Corral. So what happens to him? He has to be very impressive to win over the new coaching staff, or he just goes back in the pile with a bunch of quarterbacks that we've seen get drafted in the third, fourth round and never end up playing. Or Matt rule keeps his job, but how does Matt rule keep his job? Probably because Sam Darnold plays very, very well. And, uh, you know, earns that role and Matt rule gets to keep his job. Right? So I don't see how corral gets in the mix here. It'd have to be like, you know, they win the first couple games, Darnold gets hurt. Here comes Corral and he's better. Like that's like the one window of opportunity I really see for Corral with how it's like, well, we have, we traded uh, a couple pieces for Carson Wentz. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't, we're going to go back to the drawing board. And we already have this in-house guy that we took in the fifth round last year that a lot of teams were considering a first, second round talent, but he didn't have the leadership ability. Well, if that grows and he still has that same talent, and it's the same coaching staff that just drafted him. There's more confidence in him. So I, I like the Sam Howell as a dart throw pick. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, I want to say Malik Wills, but I mean, it's obvious that Malik Wills has all kinds of upside. Um, I think um, a couple, well, I know you like one other rookie. So why don't you talk about the, the other rookie that you like before I dive into a couple other of these names? I mean, this is, this is just a guy I grabbed in the final round of a few super flex rookie draft spots. I like it's, this strategy though. That's why I brought it up here. Bailey Zappi who put up just freaky college numbers and he does not have a big arm. Like that's what's the knock on him is going to be, but like, it's not all about a big arm as, as Matt Waldman has pointed out in his, right. Uh, you know, in his dissection of the quarterback position and where you succeed and everything. And I, I know Waldman kind of likes Bailey Zappi. So that gave me a little bit more confidence in him. And he was drafted earlier than a lot of people thought he was going to be drafted. And he went to a guy Ahead of and a out. team that's had some pretty good success with uh, late round dart throws at quarterback with Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. So um, it kind of interesting that he might get to sit and be uh, Mac Jones top backup as early as, as this year. We'll see. I mean, I think he's technically third on the depth chart, but uh, I I think he's probably going to be number two by the end of camp. Yeah. I mean, what is, is it Hoyer the destroyer? I think it's Hoyer. Yeah. uh, Ahead of him. So um, I, I don't, I don't expect Zappy to move ahead of Hoyer. I think if Hoyer sticks, it's because he's smart, but this is, these are the type of guys that, uh, Belichick loves. It's a guy that's going to come in and he ain't going to screw it up with turnovers. That that's exactly right. what he is. He's a guy who's going to be able to make all the throws. And sometimes those guys turn into studs, you know, and we've seen him do it. He did it with Matt Castle. He did it with Jimmy G. Like there are plenty of times that a backup quarterback has come in for a hurt starter, looked pretty good and then got traded and earned a, a starting job. You know, 
It doesn't always work out like Jimmy G. Sometimes it's Matt Castle. And, you know, it's funny when I was at the uh, the All-Star game in Kansas City, the MLB All-Star game in 2012, Matt Castle came up in the celebrity softball game and they were booing the crap out of him <laughs> in Kansas City because, you know, guy didn't have a good year. So, um, you know, but but Belichick has been able to to pedal these guys off if they have the opportunity and look good. So I like that call out for sure. Um, a couple deeper names that I think that we maybe have forgotten about. Let's not forget how good Tyler Huntley looked in re replacement of Lamar Jackson last year. So his contract comes up, or if someone offers uh, Baltimore something for him, uh, I think it would be, uh, it's a good dart throw, especially in a deep league super flex, you know, where you have that end of the bench, but you're looking at a guy, it's like, you know, you're looking at Jamar Jefferson uh, from Detroit or Tyler Huntley. You know, sure, maybe Jamar Jefferson would could get in there if Swift and Williams and Reynolds all get hurt. Then, yeah, sure, there's opportunities and running backs get hurt. But I think I'd you know rather bank on Tyler Huntley at that point because if he does get in there, then you can trade him off for something that you know way better than Jamar Jefferson. You know, so um, it, it, it's things like that that we're looking for uh, in these type of players. Uh, Jordan Love, I know he hasn't been impressive um, in Green Bay, and you haven't liked him. I even saw you just roll your eyes at me. But he's still young, and he's still got talent. He's got some wheels. Like, the, the guy can move a little bit here. He was good at Utah State. Obviously, much better his sophomore year than his junior year. But... He has a little mobility. He can move around. He can make some stuff happen. I know you haven't liked him, but uh, I'm. he's a first-rounder, right? And that's really the thing is that first-rounders get looked at differently. They get given second chances more and more and more. So that's another guy. What do you think about either one of those two guys, Pat? Um, so, I mean, let's see if the return of quarterbacks coach Tom Clements can revive Jordan Love's flagging career. Um, yeah, I mean, it just hasn't been impressive. Like wasn't, you know, last year was year two and just wasn't good in, in the preseason was very bad. The one game they needed him to play well in when they, uh, Rogers had COVID and they needed him to make a start in Kansas city. And the defense played absolutely lights out and smothered Patrick Mahomes. And all they needed was a dude who could, you know, maybe put together a couple of drives and love failed miserably. He was just yeah. uh, terrible. And uh, I'm sorry, Boggs, who was the other guy we were talking about? I was caught up in my uh, scorn <laughs> for Jordan Love. Well, Tyler Huntley. Oh, uh, and Huntley. Yeah. Like and, and speaking of the Packers, I mean, Huntley almost beat the Packers when the Ravens were just decimated by injuries, like Huntley played a really good game in Baltimore. Uh, I want to say that was like last November or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm like intrigued by him as a sort of uh, Lamar Jackson light, sort of a guy who does have that running ability and, um, you know, maybe could establish himself as one of the better backups in the league. So yeah, in deep, in deep dynasty leagues where you can afford to keep four or five quarterbacks on your roster, he would be not a bad choice to be the fourth or fifth guy. Uh, a couple other guys that I just have listed that I, you know, like I said, super flex deep, you know, 16 man, deeply deep dynasty. You're just throwing darts to see. I like Kyle Trask. Uh, you know, there's a kid out of Florida that en ended up in Tampa Bay and sitting behind Tom Brady, which is an excellent spot to be in. Uh, he doesn't have rushing upside. Like a lot of these other guys that we talked about, uh, he's actually way more of a statue, but he's learning behind the best statue that you can learn behind. Right. Uh, in, in Tom Brady. And, uh, the, the thing that I specifically like about, uh, Trask and what I mentioned, you know, writing him up in the black book last season was every year Trask got better at Florida. He was, you know, okay. Then a little bit better, just okay. You didn't think he was going to win a job. Then when he won the job, he was good. So just the fact that you've seen him stack on performances and not slide backwards at all in college. You know, Jordan Love is a guy that did slide back. He had a good sophomore year, bad junior year, still ended up as a first round pick based on his skill set, but slid back and hasn't looked good. We don't know what Trask looks like. He hasn't gotten a shot in the NFL yet. So I like him as a potential dart throw because that that offense is loaded. You know, they still have Mike Evans, still have Chris Godwin. Uh, you know, they, they have Leonard Fournette. So the offense is nice and loaded. 
Um, so I, I think that given an opportunity, uh, he could be good. And the last one I'll mention, and this is a complete Homer, uh, pick, but you know, uh, Sam Ellinger at Texas just did a lot running the ball and he's very, very similar to Tim Tebow, in my opinion, in, in terms of like, he's got a pop gun arm. It's not very big. Uh, he can make all the throws, but he's never going to be a guy that's just going to chuck it up deep. He's never going to be a Rogers. He's never going to be a Roethlisberger, a guy that is just, you know, got a massive arm, uh, but he can get it done with his legs. So if he could get the opportunity to play, uh, I would be really excited about his fantasy presence, but he should be behind Matt Ryan. And when Matt Ryan goes, he should bring someone else in. That's why these are deep dives, dart throw guys. So let's move on over to tight end. Pat, what do you say? Yes, Boggs. We uh, gave tight end short shrift the last two shows when we were talking about targets and avoids <laughs> for us. And so like, finally we get to talk about tight ends. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, ran out of time uh, on the tight ends. And the first one you have here, um, I just have to say that I've been on the bandwagon uh, you know, for the last couple seasons. So give me the first guy. That, well, once again, same deal as quarterbacks. These are 25 down because, you know, in a 12 man league, even in a dynasty league, not many people aren't taking much more than one tight end. So we're taking the top two tight ends, tight end one, tight end two, that group off the board. So this is ECR ranked 25 and below. The first guy here is, I'm just going to say he's both of our favorites. Oh, Adam Troutman. Yeah. Yes. So uh, a guy falling out of the top 24 for a young starting tight end and pretty much the clear cut starter. No real competition there. Uh, as far as I can tell, good situation. So he's already got a foothold in the Saints offense last year. 27 catches, 263 yards, two touchdowns and only 13 games. And only seven of those were games that J Jameis Winston started. Otherwise, it was Trevor Simeon and uh, uh, Taysom Hill. So not an ideal situation for the Saints last year. But Adudu was just a prolific pass catcher out of Dayton. Yes, granted, a small school, uh, you know, lower level of competition. But his final year there, 70 catches, 916 yards, and 14 touchdowns. And I think he has got a bunch of Dayton receiving records, not just tight end yeah. records, but like yeah, all their records. receiving records. Um, he looked like, um, I, like, I don't know, he looked like peak Tony Gonzalez playing at Dayton, right? Because he's playing against guys that are like, you know, me, look like me, you know, short, uh, you know, probably shouldn't be playing football, reliving their high school glory days type of dudes, you know, and he was smoking a lot of them. But like you can see it, you know, just watching his his film, you can see a top end tight end there. Um, So I what I was worried about with him coming in was his blocking and his rookie season in 2020. He ended up as the number one ranked blocking tight end in football, according to PFF. So I, I was like, well, this all, this guy is blocking. Great. He's going to get out there as a starting tight end this year and succeed and <laughs> did not do it last year. So like you said, NFL, not for long. What have you done for me lately? And he is being buried. So that is the, the, this is the as quintessential deep dive pick right here is Adam Troutman. And uh, I'm absolutely with you. Nice. What about you, Boggs? Who's uh, atop your list? Well, I mean, um, Tommy Tremble is probably going to be my number one uh, here. You know, um, and the reason I like Tommy Tremble is because all the stuff that I said about uh, Adam Troutman, like you can see it. He he did that at Notre Dame. And this is a guy that I thought, all right, well, I, I did not like Ian Book as a quarterback for him. And, you know, if you watched Ian Book play in the NFL uh, last season, because he was one of those Saints starters that, that got a shot last year because they had so many quarterback injury issues. And I think, um, was it Taysom Hill went on the COVID list? Or maybe he was banged up. I can't remember. But remember, Ian Book had to start a game. Oh, and I forgot like about the Ian Book. Trash. Yes. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, it threw like four picks or something. He looked awful. So that is what uh, Tommy Tremble had to deal with uh, in Carolina. And I just like the fact that Matt Rule has talked him up so much last year, said we're going to use him. Obviously, rookie tight ends are tough to get on the field. And th this position is probably the toughest to throw darts on because there are there are a lot of guys that had success catching the ball in college that will come out of the NFL. And, yeah, you can catch the ball, but 
if you can't get yards after the catch and you can't block, you will not be on the field in the NFL. Uh, but Tommy Tremble does both of those very, very well. He blocks well and he gets yards after the catch. All he needs is targets, in my opinion. So I'm a little reluctant to draft him everywhere because his quarterback is Sam Darnold and, uh, you know, it just has not worked out there. Uh, the offense looks, you know, it, without CMC, it looks putrid there too. So I just, um, it, it, it's a tough off offense for Tommy Tremble to be in, but I think with his skill set and giving him more snaps, he is going to be able to uh, be one of those mid tier uh tight end twos by the end of the season. So uh, in a deeper league, I am snapping him up. And let's not forget, you know, I'm not calling him George Kittle, but this is the area that George Kittle came out of, you know, uh, came in, was okay as a rookie, kind of got a little, you know, uh, love and then boom, breaks out. I don't, you know, I'm not saying that Tommy Tremble is one of those guys. I don't know that he's Mark Andrews. I don't know that he's Kittle or Kelsey or anyone like that, that upper echelon, but I think he can be a startable tight end by the end of this season, because I've seen the flashes and just, you know, all he needs now is opportunity. He did, he did it a couple times last year and they even ran him at the goal line a couple times uh, last season too. So if they incorporate that a little bit to take the load off of Christian McCaffrey, I mean, I think Tommy Tremble could be a nice weapon in this Panthers offense. So he is the one that I look at in terms of deep dives. And I say right now he's ECR is 40. Uh, uh, for um, you know, our expert consensus ranking over at Fantasy Pros. Once I drop my update, uh, it's going to be higher than forty. Uh, but uh, you know, not not crazy high, but much higher than forty, I think. So, uh, Tommy Tremble is probably my my. I, he's really my number two because Troutman's my number one. Like I said before, but uh, but you had Troutman, so uh, Tommy Tremble will be my number one. Who who else do you have in tight ends here? Yeah, uh, just a quick comment, and not about uh. Tremble specifically, but I mean, I guess this applies to both Tremble and Troutman. Like, Boggs, you're a, a fantasy baseball guy, too. I know you're uh, mm-hmm. part of the host rotation and our, our leading off show daily. That was Just today. Yep. Give a little bonus plug for that show. Thank but, you, thank um, you. So you are familiar with the term post-hype sleeper in oh, yeah. uh, fantasy baseball. And, and really, that applies to there's all this hype about the, the top prospects in fantasy baseball in, in MLB. They often come up to the big leagues. And do not do well in their first time around. No surprise there because they are making Jared a jump Kelnick. from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jared, Wisconsin boy, Jared Kelnick. Exactly. These guys go from double or triple A uh, competition to the big leagues. And not surprisingly, they struggle with the, the t- much tougher pitching, Breaking much balls, tougher yeah. hitters they see if they're pitchers. You know, like so there's a an adjustment there. And I think we see the same thing with tight ends. Like the maybe because these guys have to learn both the you know the the pass blocking and yeah the, the blocking and the route running pass catching uh, there's a lot on their plate and a lot of these guys don't pop unless they are you know rare species like Kyle Pitts in right. year one so um so like there's some excitement about these guys when they come in as rookies then they don't do anything then there's like zero interest in them. Like Trout, <laughs> Troutman and and Tommy Tremble, those guys are like free in best ball drafts. Right, right. And even in Dynasty where you're taking the youth into consideration, like they're easily available as like throw-ins and trades. So, yeah. and I guess another guy who falls into that category, Boggs, is Brevin Jordan, who for a few more days anyway, anyway is still only 21 years old. He turns 22 next month. Uh you know, inactive his first seven games with the Texans after being an early declare out of Miami. Uh, last year at Miami, 38 catches, 576 yards, seven TD catches. And first year after being inactive for those seven games, uh, 20 catches, 178 yards and three touchdowns for the Texans. So he kind of made a little bit of noise in his basically half season with Houston. And again, limited offense, working with a fellow rookie as the quarterback. Um, you know, I'm not guaranteeing stardom or tight end one level production for Brevin Jordan at any point soon, but he's really intriguing and he's fairly cheap right now, uh, just cause you know, modest draft pedigree and, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem he's in is not great. And if you want to talk about guys that have just zero competition at all for playing time. It's Brevin Jordan. I mean, the guys behind him are Pharaoh Brown, 
uh, a free agent pickup for uh, Houston. Uh, Tegan Quintero, who wasn't even really on my radar coming out of Oregon State, um, just has had a lot of injury stuff at Oregon State. Daryl Daniels has limited experience. Anthony Auclair um, is a unrestricted free agent they signed. They uh, picked up uh, UDFA Seth Green uh, out of Minnesota. Like There is no one in front of Brevin Jordan right now. So uh, I think that's a great call. And we saw a couple flashes of Brevin Jordan last year. I think um, he scored a couple touchdowns, right? Let me see. Three. Here it was. Yeah, three touchdowns last season. And he had a couple big games here. So, and, and there's, you know, room for guys to grow in this offense, like you said with Davis Mills. So uh, I really, really like that one. Um, you know, there's a couple other, like the rookie class here um, Dolkich, Jelani Woods, uh, Aconquo. Uh, Grant Calcaterra, Colt Turner. These are guys that are going well beyond, you know, pick uh, 40 here. Dolkich, I think it's 39. So, uh, but the other rookies from this class, Pat, are, um, you know, uh, they're all guys that had success in college that could come in and make a big impact. Uh, I would put Woods ahead of Dolkich, even though I like Dolkich probably better. I think Dolkich is more well-rounded, but he's also got Albert O in front of him and you know uh denver was confident enough in albert O to trade noah fan to seattle in the deal to get russell wilson so i just kind of read that as this is albert o's job and you know dolkich is going to come in and be a backup and we've seen denver draft many many a tight end and just ruin them uh so which seems like maybe that happened to noah fan because i was all aboard the Noah Fant hype train, him and TJ Hawkinson were going to be amazing. And Fant has obviously not lived up to it, had some rough quarterback play as well. Um, but is there anyone in particular from this uh, cl- class that we haven't mentioned that that you want to bring up here? Yeah. Can we say that Denver ruined uh, Wisconsin tight end Troy Fumagalli? Because I'm going to bring up another Wisconsin tight end, Bugs. My Dude, guy. Jake Butt as well. Like Jake, I know <laughs> Jake, Jake Butt. Butt yes. He was a. Up his- his they, knee in the orange bowl right before the draft. Yep. But that guy was going to be a second, third round pick before that. And uh, I think he ended up going in the fifth or the sixth to Denver and just didn't amount to anything. No, so, I know um, they, they've, they've wrecked a lot of those guys. So I, I'm probably not as excited as I should be on Dolkich with him landing in Denver, just because I've seen this story before. Well, maybe it's know. just the the big 10 tight ends who go to Denver who uh, <laughs> get screwed up Bog. So um Anyway, we've got Jake Ferguson now, another Wisconsin mm-hmm. guy in Dallas. And I kind of, I'm intrigued because he was the uh, best pass catcher at Wisconsin the last two years from the time Quintez Cephas left the program. Like, I think uh, Ferguson led them in catches both years. Now, I wasn't saying a lot because it is a pop gun passing attack with uh, Graham Mertz these last couple of years. Um, but, like, he was good. He's a fearless dude. He's athletic enough and he is basically now on the same potential path to relevance that Dalton Schultz was on uh as the number two tight end in Dallas uh Jarwin I think is kind of out of the picture now due to injuries so um you know yeah, Schultz, they, cut, they cut Jarwin I think I don't think he's off the roster I think well actually but I mean of, his like I think his body, career might yeah, yeah and his career could be over he's a June first cut so he should be off the team now so yeah, yeah. so um Schultz, like everyone's excited about him now as like a top six, top seven tight end. Um, he's Ferguson is a Schultz injury away from like immediate fantasy relevance, like people picking him up in redraft leagues. And um, I just, you know, I always liked what I saw out of him at Wisconsin, like just a, a true quality two way tight end who I think has a chance and was going undrafted in most rookie drafts this year. So he's going to be probably available on the waiver wire of most leagues. If you're fiddling around and you're really uh, unhappy with, you know, whatever the 28th or 30th man on your roster, Ferguson might be worth a shot. Yeah. I, I like this uh, a lot I, because it, it's, you see him on the same path as Dalton Schultz. So as long as there's just a little bit of a nice working relationship with him and Dak, Dak will get guys on the field. If if Dak likes you, that's all it takes. It is uh, that's it for you to to uh, get listed here. Um, a couple other guys that I like. Um, you know, it kind of it kind of hurt 
that they took Jelani Woods to me. Uh, the the Colts did, and, and they still have um, Mo Ali Cox is still on the roster here. Um, but uh, how about Kylan Granson, a kid uh, they took last year? This is a good pass catching tight end, and. I don't know that he's ever going to have a huge role because they rotate so many tight ends. And I do think Jelani Woods is a lot better than him. So I think if there is going to be a guy to take over this role, it is going to be Jelani Woods. But we've seen Mo Alley Cox come out of nowhere and catch a bunch of touchdowns, right? I think that's something that Kylan Granson can do. So if you're in a tight end premium league and you're stashing tight ends, Kylan Granson could be a decent fantasy option. Um, Another guy, Foster Moreau. We've seen uh, Foster Moreau have success when Darren Waller has been injured. Uh, obviously, Darren Waller is still in Vegas, but we had a lot of trade rumors. I mean, we heard Green Bay was close to acquiring Darren Waller uh, a couple times in this offseason. So I don't know that you know his existence in Vegas is going to be forever. And should that should he go away or get hurt? Because we saw Waller get hurt uh, and play hurt for a lot of the season last year. Foster Moreau has flashed a little success. Um, good pass catching tight end coming out of UCLA a couple of years ago and has been solid in the NFL as well. So uh, those are a couple other names at tight end that I like here. Do you like either one of those and who else is on your list? Pat? Not so much on Moreau. Like he was a little disappointing. I think when Waller was out last year, but then again, Boggs, I mean, like we talked about the, the post hype sleeper tight end thing, and maybe Moreau was young enough where he fell into that and just wasn't quite ready yet. Uh, mm. One guy for me is Harrison Bryant also. Yeah. I mean, a dude who a his final year at Florida Atlantic had a thousand yards and um, had kind of, I don't know if you'd call it a breakout, but he had like a 400 yard season as like a 19 year old sophomore. So like he's produced and the Browns took him in the early fourth. And then just kind of like he was another log. Well, they on... still had Hooper on the roster yeah. and in Joku, right? right? When they so drafted him. Brian yeah, was... So you're like, what is happening with Brian? But then he got on the field. He Even was with another those guys on the roster. Another piece of kindling on their tight end bonfire. And uh <laughs> yeah, man, they uh so they've removed one of those logs on the bonfire with uh by getting Hooper out, and now it's basically Njoku and Bryant, and they've had this big quarterback upgrade going from Mayfield to Deshaun Watson. So still don't have a lot at wide receiver either. Amari Cooper and then, you know, a bunch of David Bell, Donovan Peoples Jones, Anthony Schwartz. Like there's room for both tight ends to produce here. And uh I wouldn't be surprised if we saw like a mini Bryant breakout this year. I like that call. I like that call for sure. Is there anyone else uh, on the list that you want to stick your neck out for? I mean, tight ends are a hard group to uh, to want to really dive in on, but you got anybody else? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know about sticking my neck out for this guy, Boggs, but <laughs> Josiah DeGuara of the Packers, who actually was a third round pick, even though I was like, you know, thought it was just a terrible pick at the time. But he did have an interesting year last year, 25 catches, 245 yards, two touchdowns. The Packers don't have a lot at wide receiver post uh, Devontae Adams and Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Tan Tanyan is sort of a, a man more of opportunity, I think, than like a truly skilled pass catcher right. there. Tanyan so, is what happens when uh, Devontae's getting triple covered, right? That's, pretty much. That's exactly pretty what much. Uh, was his deal. And I and I like Tanyan, but now that Devontae's gone, I don't know about this tight end spot in Green Bay. Yeah, so, so DeGuara's mildly interesting as, you know, maybe a, a last guy on the roster type. Uh, I, just a couple other names for me here. You know, I mentioned some of the rookies, Aconquo, Calcaterra, Colt Turner, all really good pass catchers. But Isaiah Likely is one of those interesting ones to me because they took, um, they obviously still have Mark Andrews and he's been extended. So he's going to be there for a while. But they're looking for someone to play in the slot, whether it's going to be Duvernay or somebody else. Bateman is kind of your number one outside guy now that uh, Marquise Brown is gone. So I could see Isaiah likely getting a shot at that slot role and becoming, you know, at least a red zone target for them. So that's another guy that, you know, if, like I said, if you're playing in a tight end premium, uh, you're looking for someone, I think he could be good. Uh, I really like Noah Gray uh, for Kansas city. Obviously Kelsey is the number one there, but Noah Gray is a really good pass catching uh, and really all around tight end uh, coming out of Duke last year. 
who I think would flourish if given opportunity. So I, I like Noah Gray and Hunter Long in, in Miami. I mean, they have Gasicki, another guy. These guys are skilled dudes that are blocked. So these are more like, you know, you're not going to see them work into a, a huge role or anything, but these are guys that are going to be behind a couple big tight ends and potentially get work with an injury. So these are more tight end premium, deep league dart throws, but those are a couple other guys I like. Uh, did we get it all? Fitzy, is that it? I think we did. Let me just throw one more name out, Bob. Yes, and this please. guy's a, a deep stat. Jacob Harris on the Rams. Uh, oh, okay. Fourth round pick, wide sort receiver of, tight end convert out of UCF. Just, yes. Yeah, just an athletic freak. And they spent a fourth round pick on him. But we knew, like he, with the relative inexperience, I think we knew we were going to get a red shirt year out of him. So um, a guy people are just going to forget about after, you know, maybe being intrigued by his, uh, you know, prospect pedigree and athleticism. And, you know, a guy in a Sean McVay offense, who knows? So just one name to stash away in your maybe waiver, waiver wire Rolodex for later in the season. It's hard to know what the Rams are doing with these picks, right? Because it's like I know, we they, they trade all of them and, and then, you know, they win the Super Bowl last year. But it's like Tutu Atwell was a third round pick and did nothing. Jacob Harris was a fourth round pick and did nothing like <laughs> At some point, some of these picks are going to have to pay yeah, off. I, I you guess know, draft pedig- all of them. Draft pedigree means a little bit less when it's uh, less need, <laughs> less need yeah. giving you that draft pedigree. But hey, man, I mean, uh, he definitely has like some interesting athletic traits. So Harris oh, yeah. might be a guy to watch for sure. I would way rather have him than a couple guys that are going uh, ahead of him. Like, I mean, Will Disley. Jeff Swain, Blake Bell, you right. know, like, come on, man. Like, you know, th- these are these are good players. Disley scored some touchdowns in the NFL, but come on. You know, uh, I'll, I'll take the upside on, on a guy that is kind of just looking for an opportunity because, like we know, the NFL, not for long. Everybody gets hurt. And tight end is a brutal position where these guys, barely any of them, any of them make it through the season clean, including the premium guys. So uh, it's, you know, the second most brutal position, I would say, behind running back in the NFL because these guys go over the middle. They get hit by linebackers and charging safeties uh, all the time. So uh, it's hard for them to last as long, uh, but that is going to wrap it up. Uh, Fitz at Fitz underscore FF on the Twitter machine. What is coming up for you this week, my man? Oh, just continuing to work on the soon to be rolling out redraft kit. So I know uh, even though this is a dynasty show bogs, I know a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers play in redraft league. So uh, keep an eye out for that. That is going to hit a little bit later in June. I have been also working on that. I got some IDP stuff coming for you guys in that draft kit. Get those leagues, turn them on over to IDP and listen to Joe and I, Uh, you know, we will be coming up with the IDP show sooner rather than later here. So uh, take a look for that for all you premium subscribers to fantasy pros. And I'll be working on that. Of course, you can find me on the Twitter at Bogman sports and in this league.com for all my stuff with the Welsh. We're doing fantasy football, fantasy baseball, all kinds of good stuff over there. And we have some expanded stuff coming uh, pretty soon over there as well. So please check that out and we'll see you guys next week to do running backs. So, uh, you know what? If you want, hit us up with some running backs uh, that you guys want to stash at Bogman sports at Fitz underscore FF. Let us know who you like to stash in the later rounds. We'll see if they line up with what we like as well. So check that out. We will see you guys next week. Take it easy, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.